After a two-month hiatus, I am back now for part four, chapter one. The first few minutes were crucial, and they were maddening. The oarsmen did their best to pull together, but they were clumsy and out of practice, and hampered by their own anxiety. The encircling ice fouled the oars, and collisions were unavoidable. Men crouched in the bows of each boat and tried to pull off the bigger pieces of ice, but a great many outweighed the boats themselves. The raised sides of the James Caird and the Dudley Docker were an added hindrance. They made the seats too low for proper rowing, and though cases of stores were placed under the four oarsmen in each boat, it was still an awkward business. The sledged astern of the Dudley Docker continually got hung up on bits of ice, and after a few minutes, Worsley angrily cut it loose. And yet, to their surprise, and almost in spite of themselves and the jealous hands that tried to hold them back, they were making headway. With each boat length, the ice seemed looser. <laughs> it was difficult to tell whether the pack was opening or whether they were escaping from the ice surrounding Patience Camp. In either case, for the moment, luck was on their side. The overcast sky seemed almost alive with birds, cape pigeons, terns, fulmers, and Antarctic silver-gray and snow petrels by the thousands. The birds were so thick, their droppings spattered on the boats and forced the rowers to keep their heads lowered. Whales, too, seemed everywhere. They surfaced on all sides, sometimes frighteningly close, especially the killers. The James Caird was in the lead with Shackleton at the, at the tiller. So far as the ice permitted, he set a course for the northwest. Next came Worsley, steering the Dudley Docker, then Hudson in the Stancombe Wills. The sound of their voices chanting stroke, 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 mingled with the cries of the birds overhead and the surge of the swell through the pack. With each stroke, the oarsmen fell more into the rhythm of their task. In fifteen minutes, Patience Camp was lost in the confusion of ice astern. But Patience Camp no longer mattered. That soot-blackened flow, which had been their prison for nearly four months, whose every feature they knew so well, as convicts, know each crevice of their cells, which they had come to despise, but whose pers uh, preservation they had prayed for so often, belonged now to the past. They were in the boats, actually in the boats, and that was all that mattered. They thought neither of patient camp, nor of an hour hence. There was only the presence, and that meant row, get away, escape. Within thirty minutes they had entered an area of very open pack, and by two-thirty they were easily a mile away from Patience Camp. They could not have found it again even if they had wanted. Their course carried them close to a high, flat-topped berg, which was taking a terrific pounding from the northwest swell. The seas broke against its ice-blue sides, flinging spray sixty feet into the air. Just as they threw a beam of it, they became aware of a deep, hoarse noise that was rapidly getting louder. Looking to starboard, they saw a lava-like flow of churning, tumbling ice at least two feet high and as wide as a small river, bearing down on them out of the east-northeast. It was a tide rip, a phenomenon of current thrown up from the ocean floor which had caught a mass of ice and was propelling it forward at about three knots. For a moment, they stared in disbelief, then Shackleton swung the bow of the James Caird to port and shouted for the other two boats to follow. The oarsmen dug in their feet and pulled with all their strength away from the onrushing ice. Even so, it was gaining on them. The rowers were facing astern, looking straight at the ice, almost at eye level as it drove toward them. Those men who were not rowing urged the oarsmen on, counting cadence for them and stamping their feet at the same time. The Dudley Docker was the most cumbersome boat to row, and twice she was almost overtaken, but she managed to keep it clear. After fifteen minutes, as the strength of the men at the oars began to fail them, the tide rip showed signs of flattening out. Five minutes later, it seemed to lose its strength, and before long, it had disappeared as mysteriously as it had risen. Fresh men took over the oars from the weary rowers, and Shackleton brought the James Caird back onto a northwest course. The wind gradually swung around to the southeast so that it was blowing from astern, and it greatly aided their progress. The position when the boats were launched was 61 degrees, 56 minutes south, 53 degrees, 56 minutes west, near the eastern reaches of what is called Brantfield Strait. 
Ransfield Strait is about 200 miles long and 60 miles wide, lying between the Palmer Peninsula and the South Shetland Islands. It connects the hazardous Drake Passage with the waters of the Weddell Sea. And it is a treacherous place. It was named in honor of Edward Bransfield, who, in 1820, took a small brig named the Williams into the waters which now bear his name. According to the British, Bransfield was thus the first man ever to set eyes on the Antarctic continent. In the 96 years between the time of Bransfield's discovery and that afternoon of April 9, 1916, when Shackleton's men threaded their boats through the ice, precious little had been learned about conditions in these unfrequented waters. Even today, the U.S. Navy Department's sailing directions for Antarctica, in describing conditions in Bransfield Strait, begins with an apologetic explanation that there is a paucity of information about the area. It is believed, the sailing directions continue, that strong erratic currents are to be found, sometimes reaching a velocity of six knots. These currents are, o are affected only slightly by the wind, so that often a condition known to sailors as a cross sea is set up. When the wind is blowing in one direction and the current moving in another, at such times, angry hunks of water, three, six, ten feet high, are heaved upwards, much as when breakers are thrown back from a, from a bulkhead and collide with incoming waves. A cross sea is a perilous thing to a small boat. Furthermore, the weather in Bransfield Strait is reliably inhospitable. Some reports say the sky is clear only 10% of the time. Snows are heavy and gales are common, beginning in the middle of February and becoming more frequent and violent, and more violent as the Antarctic winter draws closer. The boats in which the party set sail upon this forbidding sea were sturdy enough, but no open boat was really equal to the voyage they faced. The Dudley Docker and the Stancombe Wills were cut, uh, cutters, heavy, square-sterned boats of solid oak. Their Norwegian builders called them bottleneck, or excuse me, bottlenose killer boats, because they were originally designed for hunting bottlenose wells. In the bow of each was a stout post to which the harpoon lines was intended to be fastened. They were 21 feet 9 inches long, with a 6 foot 2 inch beam, and they had three seats or thwarts plus a small decking in the bow the bow and in the stern. They also mounted stubby masts to which a sail could be secured, but they were primarily pulling boats designed for rowing, not sailing. The only real difference the two was that between the two was that McNeish had added planks to the Dudley Docker, which raised her sides about eight inches. The James Caird was a double-ended whale boat, twenty-two feet six inches long and six feet three inches wide. She had been built in England to Worsley's specifications of Baltic pine, planking over a framework of American elm and English oak. Though she was somewhat larger than the other two, she was a lighter, springier boat because of the materials of which she was built. McNeish had raised her sides about 15 inches so that, even fully loaded, she rose a little more than two feet out of the water. The Caird was thus by far the most seaworthy of the three. In terms of weight, the boats were not overloaded. The Wills carried eight men, the Docker nine, and the Caird eleven. In less stormy waters, with less bulky gear, each might have accommodated at least twice that number. As matters stood, the boats were uncomfortably crowded. The hoop tents and the rolled up sleeping bags took up a disproportionate amount of room. There were also cases of stores and a considerable amount of personal gear, all of which left scarcely enough space for the men themselves. Throughout the afternoon, as they held to a northwesterly course, the three boats made excellent progress. There were belts of ice that were fairly thick, but none so dense as to block their way. Shortly after five o'clock, the light began to fail. Shackleton called to the other boats to stay close, by until a suitable camping place was found. They rowed until about 5.30, when they came to a flat, heavy flow some 200 yards across which Shackleton decided was sturdy enough to camp on. Nearly a half dozen approaches were made in the surging swell before the boats were safely hauled onto the ice. It was 6.15 by the time the landing was completed. Green set up his blubber stove while the remainder of the party pitched the tents, except for number five, which was so flimsy that Shackleton granted permission for its occupants to sleep in the boats.
Supper consisted of a quarter pound of dog pemmican and two biscuits apiece. It was finished by eight o'clock, and all hands, except the watch, turned in. It had been a tiring but exciting day. By Worsley's estimate, they had made a good seven miles to the northwest. Through the distance itself, though the distance itself was not impressive, the fact that they the fact that they had finally taken to the boats was the fulfillment of a dream. After five and a half months on the ice, they were underway at last, doing some good for oneself, as Macklin put it. They dropped off to sleep almost immediately. Crack oh, the watchman's cry rang out within five minutes after the last man had turned in. The weary men stumbled out of their tents, some of them even without even bothering to dress. But it was a false alarm. There was no crack, and the men crawled back into their sleeping bags. Toward 11 o'clock, Shackleton became strangely uneasy, so he dressed and went outside. He noticed that the swell had increased and their flow had swung around so that it was meeting the seas head on. He had stood watching for only a few moments, when there was a deep-throated thud, and the flow split beneath his feet, and directly under number four tent, in which the eight forecastle hands were sleeping. Almost instantly, the two pieces of the flow drew apart. The tent collapsed and, the, collapsed, and there was a splash. The crewmen scrambled out from under the limp canvas. Somebody's missing, one man shouted. Shackleton rushed forward and began to tear the tent away. In the dark, he could hear muffled, gasping noises coming from below. When he finally got the tent out of the way, he saw a shapeless form wriggling in the water. A man in his sleeping bag. Shackleton reached down for the bag, and with one tremendous heave, he pulled it out of the water. A moment later, the two halves of the broken flow came together with a violent shock. The man in the sleeping bag turned out to be Ernie Holness, one of the firemen. He was soaked through, but he was alive, and there was no time to worry about him then because the crack was opening once more, this time very rapidly, cutting off the occupants of Shackleton's tent and the men who had been sleeping in the cared from the rest of the party. A line was pitched across and the two little groups of men, pulling toward one another, managed to bring themselves bring the halves together once more. The cared was hurried, hurriedly shoved across, and then the men leaped to the larger flow. Shackleton waited until the others were safe, but by the time it was his turn, the pieces had drifted apart again. He took hold of the rope and tried to bring his chunk closer, but with only one man pulling it was useless. Within 90 seconds, he had disappeared into the darkness. For what seemed a very long interval, no one spoke. Then from the darkness, they heard Shackleton's voice. Launch a boat, he called. Wilde had just given the order. The wheels was slid on into the water, and a half dozen volunteers scrambled on board. They put on their oars and rowed toward Shackleton's voice. Finally, they saw his outline in the darkness, and they pulled up alongside his flow. He jumped onto the wheels, and they returned to the campsite. Sleep now was out of the question. Shackleton ordered the blubber stove, light, stove lighted. Then he turned his attention to Holness, who was shivering uncontrollably in his soaked clothes. But there weren't any dry garments to give him because their only clothes were the ones they were wearing. To prevent Holness from freezing, Shackleton ordered that he be kept moving until his own clothes dried. For the rest of the night, the men took turns walking up and down with him. His companions could hear the crackling of his frozen garments and the th tinkle of the ice crystals that fell from him. Though he made no complaint about his clothes, Hol Holness grumbled for hours over the fact that he had lost his tobacco in the water.